Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for joining. Um, it's my greatest pleasure to introduce to you Erica Palmer, our most recent hire in systems engineering. And she is doing really exciting work in bringing social science in, in, into systems engineering, which is something that I really appreciate because I'm trying to do the same thing into civil engineering, and it's not an easy task. And Erica is bringing a very, very fascinating journey to Cornell. Um, she started with a bachelor in psychology at the University of Maryland, then a first master's in, of science in biological anthropology at the University College of London, and now a master of science in industrial ecology at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim. And then a PhD that brings all this together and makes it fit to our program in systems, which is a PhD in systems engineering, engineering and social policy. Um, Erica has been doing very exciting work. You'll see in her presentation, she'll do a better job of talking about that herself. She's also very much involved with INCOSI. And in particular, she chairs the social system working group where she's developing this concept that I was mentioning of bringing social science into system engineering. And that leads to her talk. So thank you, Erica, for accepting our invitation to give this talk. And now the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ricardo. Uh, it's such a pleasure uh, to, to speak to you all today. And I really appreciate you taking the time to, to come to this talk. Um, so radical collaboration, engineering, the social sciences and humanities, that's quite a lot of disciplines in there. <laughs> so uh, this is a bit of a different kind of presentation, I think, than um, what I've seen the other Ezra talks um, have been about. And I'm not taking a deep dive into a particular type of research. Uh, I wanted to talk about my personal experiences with radical collaboration. Uh, and how that's really uh, required me to stray from the pack, uh, essentially. And it's uh, the, the things that I'm going to bring up today are fundamental to all research topics. Um, I, I haven't found any branch of science and engineering or the humanities that I haven't found uh, um, a way to work with yet. <laughs> Obviously, I haven't worked with them all, uh, but also to all levels of academia. So my story is going to be beginning in graduate school. Uh, and, uh, but it's relevant for everyone that, you know, in, in any level um, of, of their profession, uh, whether you're a seasoned uh, prof uh, professor or you're just starting out in graduate school. And, and the reason why I wanted to give this, this type of talk today is because I know that there um, are a number of graduate students that are going to be uh, watching this either now or uh, recorded. And I want to give them, if they're seeing that there's relevance of, you know, any kind of social aspects to their work, and they feel that they need to reach out into other disciplines, that there are possibilities to do so, there, even though it is a struggle, and I'm going to talk a lot about the struggle today, that there is hope, <laughs> uh, there are battles being won, and uh, it definitely is for the greater good, because it leads to really high impact research. And when I say that, I'm not talking about impact scores for journals. I'm talking about societal impact uh, because we're bringing the policy stakeholders into our research. And although I'll be talking a lot about policy today, uh, not all of my research is policy focused necessarily, uh, but I'm going to be using a lot of examples from, uh, from policy. So uh, this lovely picture here is where I'm moving from <laughs> to come to Cornell. This is a place called Indre, uh, Norway. And um, I know that Ithaca is lovely too, so I'm excited to come there. <laughs> uh, but uh, what reason I'm showing this is because I, uh, you're going to be hearing a very European presentation. I am American. Uh, but I have lived my uh, professional, my adult, I always say I've lived my adult life in Europe. <laughs> uh, so what you'll be hearing are stories about me slugging it out uh, in Europe, uh, in European universities and working in European and also some Asian uh, uh, research networks. 
And I've worked with, uh, so from the humanities, who I've worked with the most um, are by far historians and also moral philosophers, but really a lot of historians. And so what that means is when we, when I'm working with different types of historians, uh, that really shapes the type of work that I do. And what I'm going to present today to really reflects uh, those kinds of differences. Uh, and my allies have varied throughout this process. <laughs> so um, it's not that there are specific disciplines that I find it more difficult to work with. I find that it really comes down to openness and certain types of um, really personalities that make uh, radical collaboration easier. Um, but that being said, I haven't worked with every discipline yet. And those that I've worked with so far within those disciplines, I find that different schools of thought make it easier to engage. So, so jumping a little bit ahead in the story, I wanted to bring up a concept, of, the concept of living labs, because it's something that I'm doing quite a lot right now in my research. Uh, so it wouldn't be an academic presentation if I wasn't giving some proper definition of radical collaboration at the beginning. Uh, and so the, the working definition that I have for radical collaboration is that it not, it's not uh, and is your next door neighbor. So um, a lot of disciplines are working together in interdisciplinary research. That's not terribly innovative or new. Radical collaboration, though, on the other hand, are two very diverse disciplines. So, for instance, philosophers and historians working together with engineers uh, uh, to produce then high impact research for society. And so this is what I mean by that it is your next door neighbor, because what we're doing is we're creating this what's called an extended peer community where we're bringing you know, policymakers, you know, uh, those that are leading public agencies, uh, and really just for, with a citizen science approach to doing policy work uh, together with uh, those in engineering, for example, uh, to, to bring about um, societal transitions. And then this is where, um, and I'm going to bring this up later in my presentation too, where I talk more about living labs. Um, it's one method in order to uh, enable that kind of work. And so as Ricardo brought up, uh, the prequel to this story is that I do have a background in psychology and biological anthropology, although I would not say necessarily that I'm coming from the social sciences because uh, this work was had, really only informs uh, really superficially uh, to the work that I do now. For instance, I build models that where they're informed by concepts from psychology. Uh, I'm the thread chair for the system dynamics conference uh, on psychology and human behavior, for example, and my background in psychology informs that, but it's really from a systems perspective. And when it comes to biological anthropology, um, I, it's really the cultural systems that are relevant to my work now. Uh, so that's why I say systems all the way down. All these things are uh, from a systems perspective, bringing it all together for my current work. But the beginning of this story is really an industrial ecology, which is what um, I did my second master's degree in. Uh, and I'm not sure how familiar everybody here is with the uh, discipline of industrial ecology, but I like to describe it as if industrial engineering and environmental engineering had a disciplinary baby where the godparents are systems engineering and economics, then it would be industrial ecology. Uh, it's really much more, I feel, uh, a common um, uh, in Europe, uh, in European universities, uh, more, more people are familiar with this term industrial ecology. They also, um, I know that at Yale, there's, there's a big center for it and there's a, a collaboration between Yale and where I did my master's degree. But, what I wanted to, to, to bring up at the beginning of this story is that when I was doing this master's degree, I felt like I was doing a lot of different types of modeling. I was doing like, for instance, life cycle assessment, material flow analysis, input output, and you're bringing all this together because you're looking at closing loops in society uh, for circular economy, for example. Uh, and if you can see the picture on the right, this like you can see there are people in this picture and they are all focused on consumption. And when I was doing this modeling and this work, I really, I, I really just felt like 
the people were not represented in any real way uh, in industrial ecology. Now, the reason why I did this master's degree is because they wanted to bring people in from the social sciences. So, and I had a background in psychology. So they, to, to make their mark uh, in industrial ecology, really to bring together the, the social science perspective in there. But what was really happening on the ground was that they were just teaching social scientists how to do this, you know, this type of modeling, which was life cycle assessment, material flow analysis. And so it, it, it wasn't really any kind of radical collaboration in any real way. And I've really felt this need that from there, I needed to figure out a way to represent social concepts uh, and, and different aspects of society in the type of modeling, uh, types of modeling that are common in engineering. Uh, and moving forward, I felt like the best way to do that was with a systems perspective and with systems engineering. So skipping ahead now into some of the work that I'm doing or have done more recently is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with this company that's in the background, but if you're from agriculture, you probably might. Uh, and they do, a, De Laval do, they do a lot of different agricultural services, um, but in locally here uh, in the community I live in, we call them the milk robot people. Uh, so Norway is made up with lots and lots and lots of small farms and, um, De Laval is um, interacting with even small farmers to install milking robots. Uh, and so I got involved, uh, being a systems expert, you wind up getting involved in a lot of things that you didn't necessarily know that you'd ever get involved with. And this is really where the systems part of this acts as a way to foster radical collaboration. And I like to describe being a systems expert as like this threaded generalist where like I'm threading technology and society together in all these different application areas, but I'm not actually going into a deep dive into, for instance, agriculture, just bringing in the experts and in order to tie things together with other disciplines uh, to really kind of make uh, makes. Uh, this radical collaboration operate in some way. And so for this particular project, we were looking at um, farmer subjective well-being uh, and cultural capital and how cyber physical system, fiber, cyber physical social systems or CPSS interact. And so we were using milking ro robots as the example for this. And so um, I, I know this is a bit of a segue, but I did want to mention at least some of my research while I'm giving this story. Um, while I needed in my PhD and moving from industrial ecology where I needed to take a deep dive in so social systems to do work like this, my next step was not necessarily uh, creating a new research area that I was going to specialize in. I'm trying to become a systems experts slash generalists at the same time. And so this is where the middle of the story is. I needed to take a deep dive somewhere in a social science topic with using systems engineering in order to develop new ways to quantify social systems and to bring it into um, to the engineering world. And I did that with the Norwegian welfare state. Now, don't let the welfare like trigger you. If you're not familiar with welfare state research, it's the same as social policy. Uh, it's just the, uh, what we refer to it in Europe. Uh, and, but also, for example, it crosses the line into public policy as well. Um, so I wasn't just working with social sciences and I don't like lumping all the social sciences together. There's a lot of diverse disciplines in there, of course. Many disciplines make up the social sciences and, and the humanities as well. So I wanna be very explicit in who I was working with now. And that is, a lot of geographers, a lot of sociologists, and especially rural sociologists. Um, and I was working with, in the humanities, I was working with a lot of, um, as I mentioned, historians. And then also um, I got a lot into ethics as part of this. How do you ethically model social systems? And so that I was working with a lot of moral philosophers in order to um, um, create new ways to um, ethically model. So, this was the scariest part of my story. <laughs> this is where I think most of the battles happened is not necessarily during my PhD, but which is the title is there, 
but in the two networks in which I was operating. I want to also mention that all the people in that picture, very nice people. There were no battles that happened. There's no enemies that you're seeing, and there's no enemies in this at all. Uh, what, what I needed to do in this was to really take a deep dive into this and make that kind of friction happen and that tension uh, with different disciplines to really figure out how can I contribute to this type of research and how can they contribute to my research where, and none of them were coming from a systems perspective. None of them were doing any kind of simulation modeling, for example, they were all working with, for instance, pension systems. They were working with, you know, child care. They were working with sickness, absence systems, things of that nature. And I was going in there as a complete outsider and trying to find a way to learn what they were doing uh, and also try to find a way to communicate what I was doing so that we could be very innovative together. Uh, and uh, it, there were some battles that were won. I'm going to start with the good parts. <laughs> uh, so these are my all of my papers that are associated with my PhD. I worked with Norwegian work absenteeism, and I was working with um, gender issues uh, in there and as well as pension down at the bottom, but the two middle papers in there are, are both on ethics. And as I was working on this, I felt very deeply about a lot of the different ethical issues that come up when you're representing people mathematically. Uh, and because of that, um, I took a deep dive in, into ethics and I still talk a lot about ethics today uh, when, uh, even if I'm not publishing so much on ethics, but through a lot of different workshops, for example. And the class um, that I'm developing for next semester has a strong ethics theme in it. Um, so these battles were won, as in I had these papers published <laughs> and I made a lot of friends in the uh, in social sciences and the humanities doing it. And they were fantastic collaborations, uh, but they were won because of diplomacy and communication. And that might seem incredibly obvious that yes, we have to be diplomatic. Of course we need to communicate, um, but it's much more complicated and nuanced than that. So when you're on the PhD level, it's a lot easier to be humble and to check your ego at the door because you're not that far advanced into the world of academia. It becomes much harder once you're an established professional and you have things to defend because you've been publishing for a long time and you think that's valuable. Other people think that's valuable. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of state, for instance, in, uh, in, in staying in your lane. So not straying from the pack, staying in the discipline. Uh, and then this is where I, this staying in your lane <laughs> is where I really think of this concept of the professor discipline dictator. This is not any one person in any discipline, but more that there are certain people or certain theories that have to be referenced and they are the most important in any particular discipline. And if they are not adhered to, then they, it, it's very difficult to get your work in the door. And this is where you see severe specialization and very siloed departments at universities, for example. And so that there, the paraphrased quote from Max Planck, science progresses one funeral at the time, it's not any one person dying, but more that once people that are supporting certain theories move on uh, from you know, concentrating on just that and leaving their ego at the door, we're able to actually make real progress in working together towards shared intellectual frameworks because you do not owe anything to existing theories uh, and you don't owe anything to the person that taught you that specific theory. And then on communication. Um, so this is the Norwegian parliament. There's 169 representatives in the Norwegian parliament. And a lot of what I do is building policy decision making tools for the government uh, in my current position. Uh, and what happens is, is we, th by, by building these tools, and as I mentioned, we use a lot of living labs, we go out into, into the field and we bring people into the model building process. Um, but they are very uncertain models, of course, because all models of social systems are very uncertain. 
Uh, but yet policymakers still need to make decisions about policy and they still use models and tools in order to help them make that policy. When I'm communicating and I'm building diverse teams of, with different disciplines to build one of these policy um, uh, decision support tools, uh, I bring there, I'll, I'll give you an example from, from agriculture. So we'll have agricultural economists, we will have rural sociologists, we will have farmers, we will have people from diverse political parties. We have one party in Norway that's considered the farmer's party. Obviously, they're there too, um, as well as their, um, uh, they have organizations around farming communities. They are also there. Uh, and all of these people are um, help, we're elucidating community based knowledge uh, in order to inform how different policies, not social systems, but then policy systems, how they work on those social systems and how policy is implemented in those systems and whether they're going to, that policy is going to be likely to be successful or not. And so when I'm working with diverse disciplines to build these types of models and tools, uh, we, I get very often two comments. They're too deterministic and they're too uncertain. And that's absolutely true. And so it's very, when they're calling out your biggest weaknesses because they're super obvious, it's very difficult to defend yourself. But what I do is, as I tell them, uh, when you build models of anything, it's, it's showing some, well, in simulation modeling, the type that I do is, um, and just for reference, I, I do a lot of system dynamics modeling, uh, agent-based modeling, usually together with systems uh, dynamics modeling. And um, I also throw in some machine learning in there, usually in one big package. Uh, and so when you're showing different behavior over time, for example, or you're showing one number that's going to exist in some point on time, there's enormous amounts of uncertainty in that. Uh, and it's also very much a finger in the air uh, when you're looking at certain behaviors. It's more like, does it go up or does it go down? Uh, and, and that's okay, because obviously to use the box uh, quote, you know, um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And communicating that uh, to the other people who are from different disciplines on your team and showing them that like don't cover up your weaknesses, wear your weaknesses and work with them in order to minimize weaknesses where you can uh, is the best way to collaborate on these teams. And that, that point I think is really what has allowed me to be successful uh, in, uh, especially in my PhD. And I was working in these different welfare state and social policy networks uh, where they would look at this model and be like, this is all nonsense. Like you can't possibly model this. You just took all this stuff with this rich narrative that I said, and then you turn this into a set of equations. We're not going to work with you. <laughs> these are the more hostile interactions that I get. And then uh, you find the point at which that makes them insecure with working with you. And it always comes down to these two points. And so this is where I try to, to really harness our conversations and try to minimize uh, any like hostility and really make myself open to um, a kind of a diplomatic environment. Uh, but also when I'm working with those policy decision makers. So when I have a tool, for example, I very, well, I never let just a policymaker take one of these tools, punch in a bunch of numbers, and then interpret the results, which they're almost always going to do from some political ideology and use it in a way that it's not meant to be. So what we do with these tools is that we build workshops around the tools and bring the policymakers in and have a collaborative environment for not just testing policy ideas, but also understanding um, how policy implementation works and the uncertainty in that. Uh, everybody is really ex like, has tons of ideas when it comes to policy ideas, uh, and, but it's more, are they likely to work? What are the different steps that will, are required for a policy to be implemented? And what happens to the social systems that are affected when you build those? And as you can probably tell from my conversation so far on this, there are battles that are easily lost. 
Uh, so this, uh, maybe people recognize this, this is a, um, a famous, uh, like it's called the troll's tongue in Norway. Uh, it's in a part of the country called the Vestlanda or the West Country. Um, and so even though I'm talking a lot about diplomacy, it's not a silver bullet. Um, I don't always, uh, you know, win people over when we're building these kind of radical collaborations. Uh, they, for instance, um, have their certain ways of doing things and they see that their, like, their methods are more valuable. One argument that I get a lot is that you need to choose the method that is most suited to the research and simulation modeling is not the best way to, sim to interact with society. Obviously, I disagree with that statement, but it's also something where I can, for instance, we can discuss, uh, or it's a grounds for discussing. And also, when you're being diplomatic, I also need to realize and be reflective that that may be true in that particular application. Uh, it might not be modeling that's the best way to move forward. Um, and so also, I want to mention, especially to the graduate students that, that are listening to this, is that publishing this kind of work is a challenge. Um, social science journals are not that friendly towards this kind of simulation modeling, uh, in my experience, unless you're working, for instance, in like particular parts of the social science, economics is one of them. Uh, it's a lot easier to get published. Um, and if you're working in more application specific journals, for instance, the system dynamics review, then they want more methodological papers. That's something that um, becomes challenging or they only want a particular modeling type. So for instance, the journal for social, um, social simulation and artificial societies, it's jazz. Uh, they want only agent-based modeling. So it, it, it can be, a, it's difficult to navigate those publishing waters when you're doing this kind of work. And as I mentioned to some other people before, you can be rather lonely and friendless in this, in this journey. Um, when I um, was presenting some work at a, at a social policy conference, uh, uh, I was talking to um, this professor afterwards and, you know, talking about this journey and, you know, the, the hostility that you can be met with. Uh, and he asked me, he's like, why do you even, why don't you just stay in your lane? It would be so much easier. You could get your stuff published and, just get your PhD done and, you know, get it out the door and kind of move on with your life. And I'm like, oh, well, I like to, I don't like to battle with people, but, you know, I, uh, I like to have a healthy uh, argumentative conversations, let's say. <laughs> I like to find the points at which we can really break barriers and staying in your lanes is not that, it's not the way to do that. Um, so uh, battles are very easily, and this is really what I'm about to say is really coming from a European perspective. Um, university structure promotes a lot of challenges to radical collaborations. And one of the things that's so attractive about me starting at Cornell is that I see that there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of system structure even at Cornell that will be the opposite of that. They will foster radical collaboration. Um, so uh, in Europe, uh, I know all, all universities are, are siloed, but I feel that in Europe, my experience, my personal experience, um, let me just say that, is that it's much more siloed in Europe um, and that there is really very little chance in any real concrete way to collaborate between different colleges at universities. So um, if you are in the social sciences wing of a university, you will like, for instance, at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, the social sciences are not even like physically close to each other. One is like, you have to drive there. <laughs> And there's like no real kind of way to foster um, relationships um, between those kinds of departments. So um, the, the way really to foster those kinds of relationships is through transdisciplinarity. Uh, and that is defined in a lot of different ways, but this is the one that, you know, really I feel best sums it up uh, and that you are creating a unity of intellectual frameworks that go beyond disciplinary perspectives. So when I get together with those from the social sciences, obviously I'm, I'm coming from um, a systems perspective uh, and I am looking at systems theory and systems engineering and systems science and systems thinking and all of these kinds of system perspectives. And I do not wanna go in there and say, you need to do systems. Systems is the way to go. And we all come together with systems. 
what I need to do is come in there and to see where the system science and the theoretical frameworks that we're seeing in systems uh, is already naturally lends itself to strong theoretical frameworks that exist in that discipline as a place to start so that we can grow together and create research projects that have high impact for society. Uh, and so that's what transdisciplinary means for me. And that is how transdisciplinary really moves forward uh, in radical collaborative research. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit more about policy and policy modeling, even though I've talked quite a bit about it so far, but I wanna wrap this up in the next 10 minutes so we do have some time to talk. But I'm boiling the ocean is a common term in, in business and management, but I use it in a slightly different way. And if you're not familiar with it, it um, came um, from George Wills in the early 20th century about German U-boats uh, and, um, uh, I'm sorry, Will Rogers, I, I'm mixing up names here, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, German U-boats and uh, the, the policy to um, get rid of the U-boats was to boil the ocean. And um, the, um, in business and management, it's more, you use the term more when you're taking too much on, but I like to highlight it as, okay, when we're doing the, when you're doing policy and policy modeling, it's very easy to come up with policies that are very bad <laughs> because the people are not involved. And I wanna give a very good example from Norwegian onshore wind. Uh, so a lot of different, especially in uh, civil and environmental engineering, you see a lot of modeling that deals with policies and uh, policy scenarios. Uh, and what I wanna highlight is that policy is a lot more than developing scenarios. Policy really has to do with policy implementation. And uh, with onshore wind in Norway, so I'm sure people uh, maybe like in terms of just Nordic perspectives, uh, Norwegians like other uh, Nordic countries are very progressive for environmental policy. And uh, you know, they have ambitious uh, carbon emission targets and um, on paper, onshore wind, there's a lot of wind, uh, even onshore and offshore uh, in, in the Nordic region. And so let's build windmills. Um, but because Norway is so progressive in their environmental policy or not because of, they are progressive in their environmental policy because Norwegians are in love with the outdoors. And I feel like the next Nordic word that's going to be imported <laughs> to the English speaking word is friluftsliv. Uh, and this is really the Norwegian love of the outdoors. They have to be outside all the time. Um, you know, even children, when they're napping, they sleep outside uh, there. When my son was in kindergarten, he was, you know, from the moment he got there till I picked him up, he was outside the entire day. And that kind of culture means that they love their outdoors and want it to stay exactly the way it is. And they do not want it to be sullied by the appearance of windmills. And so even though on paper and in these policy scenarios that were built, they look like the perfect policy solution, <laughs> uh, it completely failed. It had to be dropped. A lot of money was lost uh, in, uh, in the run up to that plan. And so when I'm looking at policy implementation, I'm looking a lot at um, barriers and thresholds. So um, barriers for adoption, what barriers exist um, I, for instance, a lot of perception. Uh, I model perception networks for different types of technology as solutions in environmental policies, uh, and then thresholds for overcoming those barriers, uh, uh, thresholds for coming over those uh, barriers. And so back to the living lab. So how then, for instance, do we find out um, how policy is going to be implemented. And we do this with living labs and we do this with the co-production of knowledge. Uh, a lot of the modeling that you see of social systems has a ton of variables that are humongous simplifications and uh, vast assumptions that are just really difficult to work with. But when you start working in a very specific context and you start working with the people who are living these systems, you start co-producing knowledge with them to understand, for instance, what are their fundamental values? Uh, 
where does their information come from? Who is in their network? Who do they talk to? How do they talk to them? How does the information and what they're perceiving interact with fundamental values? Uh, how does how do government agencies then operate with different communities uh, to implement policy that can uh, interact with these kinds of perception systems? Uh, and then from an ethical perspective, we never want to look at changing values. Uh, how does what we do with modeling intersect with that uh, more fundamental nature of these communities? What are we doing that will cause consequences for these communities? And this is where, when you're reflecting on this, so coming um, from anthropology, it's called a reflexive turn. And so we, as the researchers, uh, we as the modelers, we as the academics, we are the stakeholders here too. And this means that we have a huge influence on these, the, the outcomes of what these models say. Uh, why are we building a model to begin with, uh, for example? And this has a lot to do with modeling ethics. So, um, and this is where the philosophers have really come in and influenced my work. Um, modeling, for instance, why are we building a model? Uh, why are we making the decisions to design it in the way that we are? Who are we involving in the model building process? Uh, can that lead to unwanted or unintended consequences for society? Uh, how does our work play a role in the life cycle of policy? Uh, and when, and this really comes back to where, when I was in industrial ecology and I was starting to build models uh, in an environmental context, and I started getting really worried about what we do and how it affects people. And, um, and in order for me to just feel good about that, I felt like radical collaboration was necessary just for me to move forward in my own research. So even taking away the high societal impact of, you know, I, of course I want my, my, my work to have high societal impact. I want it to produce some good in this world, but I was really concerned that it might do a bad job. <laughs> I, maybe I'm just very insecure about my modeling skills, but I really wanted to, beyond a technical perspective, assuming that my model is, you know, justified, um, what don't we know about the social system? As I said, it's tons of uncertainty and a lot of assumptions. And so the end of the story is that there is no real end here. Um, I, I'm, I feel like I'm still fighting the good fight. Um, I'm still looking for ways to um, uh, find, like, e with every talk that I do in, in different academic communities, I find new ways to improve the way that I am diplomatic and how I communicate. I always find one new thing that I didn't know about, like, that was important in the, like, for instance, in, in rural sociology. Uh, one thing that I have, been, have not been including in my models, which I should absolutely have been doing from the start. And so I feel that there is no end. It's continuous improvement. Um, and while I've been working a lot with agriculture because I was um, uh, a, a, for a number of years working at an applied social science research institute uh, where I was, they got most of their funding um, through the Ministry of Agriculture, so we were looking at a lot of things, for instance, when it came to uh, farmer succession and, you know, why farmers make decisions based on who's inheriting their farms. And uh, like, so how, how they, I didn't even understand how that process worked until I went out and talked to the farmers and not just one farmer, but when I talked to this farmer and this farmer with the other academics, with the, um, with policymakers who are farmers themselves, and then also um, the my my fellow rural sociologists, um, I, I there was no end to this learning. And while I'll never be a specialist in that particular type of research, uh, what I did learn is how the the methods of how to bring all of these different communities together uh, for radical collaboration. 
And so this is really where I would like to hear from you. Uh, and also when I give talks on radical collaboration, I <laughs> what happens usually afterwards is people give their own perspectives, not only on radical collaboration, but more the like our, our, our their own success stories. I mostly hear about the things you shouldn't do. Uh, and I, so it's a very humbling experience working in radical collaboration, um, like because you're putting yourself out there as like, uh, you know, you're, you're never going to be in a place where you know everything, right? Uh, you're, you're the one who is going to be, you know, pulling all the strings. You have to go in there um, without, without an ego and as a diplomat. And because of that, you are going to be out on the battlefield um, more times than you would like. And so when we, after, when I, when I give talks on this sort of thing, uh, we wind up commiserating because uh, <laughs> misery loves company, but also it's really good to share those success stories because they're really important to share to keep us doing this really good and high impactful research. So I wanna say thank you. And I look forward to hearing from you. Hi, Erica, this is Wes. Hi, Wes, how are you? I'm fine. I enjoyed that very much. I missed the first five or 10 minutes or something, but um, I think I got what you said and I can't believe how tough it is, <laughs> especially from a modeling perspective. I thought it was really interesting because when you're dealing with humans, it's hard to make hard and fast uh, heuristics or rules or things that everyone or the majority will agree upon because now it enters into politics and the whole domain is scary. <laughs> and there are a lot of political parties in Norway. If I go back to that one slide where we're like, you're, you, you have a lot of people to, who have different agendas and they're all trying to manipulate your work for their own policy goals. Uh, and they can also very easily uh, manipulate your results to their, to their own ends. So, right. yeah, it can be very scary. It's luckily it's it's lucky too that you know while I can be very friendless at times, <laughs> uh, I I have always had really good colleagues to you know kind of help in that more um, you know that kind of support moral support area. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know something, um, um, Gayo, uh, what's his name? Oliver said yesterday in our meeting was about how everyone is very congenial until you get into money. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's very agreeable on your philosophy until you start dividing up the pie, right? So once, for instance, when you were talking about like who is being allocated different funds and for what as part of your modeling, I think that tends to um, be one of the most contentious parts of these workshops. Yeah. And obviously when we're running these workshops with these policy decision-making tools, um, we're testing out different policy scenarios uh, together with implementation and then seeing what the results are. And very often, and you're explaining what your assumptions are and what the uncertainty is throughout, but when they're seeing results that they don't like, uh, because of their own policy goals, they're like, well, then your model is terrible and you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, obviously got it wrong because <laughs> I didn't agree with it. <laughs> but then, and then the complete opposite when they do, then you're, yeah, yeah. you're amazing, you're a genius. Bingo! <laughs> so, Eric, I have, I have a question for you. One thing that struck me was this idea that when you are interviewing people, uh, that you are one of the stakeholders, and I really hadn't thought of that much before. And I just, you know, if you had any more, a few more words on that, I'd really be appreciated. Yeah, and I, I chose this picture for that intentionally because um, if you see all the people in the room, um, that's very often, well, pre COVID times, um, that's very much what it would look like where you have a whiteboard in the background and you have all these different diverse stakeholders that are representative of different stakeholder groups. Uh, that um, and it's participatory modeling sometimes and sometimes it's not it, it's it's a it's a different kind of workshop just so in a more traditional living lab but me I am one of those stakeholders that is determining a lot about for instance what is the scope of this model what is the scope of this research 
Uh, how is my being present in the room leading this workshop affecting what the other people are saying? How does that contribute to the power dynamics that already exist between these different stakeholder groups? And in addition to that, you also have to manage these, these type of dynamics. And, and if you see, for instance, different stakeholder groups, they're not voicing what they need to in order to co-produce this knowledge. Um, because for instance, there's someone else in the room that is generally making them feel uncomfortable, not on a personal level, but more in terms of a stakeholder level. level. And uh, then for instance, I have to change my approach to how I get knowledge from them. And so then it would uh, switching to individual interviews, one-on-one uh, -on -one or just two at a time. Uh, so it's a very tricky art to, to that kind of living lab and the co-production of knowledge. But it's something that I think is incredibly valuable for the development of these kinds of, um, uh, this quality uh, in, in the quantification of social systems. So you as a stakeholder have to manage the way everything is operating to get what you want as well as hearing what they want. I mean, you, you need inputs for your model and, and insights. And, uh, and, and also, for instance, why am I designing the model the way I'm designing it? Is it because I already have some sort of bias as to how this system is structured? The answer to that is always yes. I, I mean, I, I'm not a neutral party. I have like my own biases and my own worldviews and I have my own slight of what, what I've been educated in, which is different from other people. So if you get someone else leading this, you would get a different type of model. And so then you need to reflect on that. And there's no way of getting around that. There's no way of building something that's completely neutral, but you have to make sure that you have some sort of reflection on that. And that's what that term reflective Term, reflexive term is that, you know, when you're in an anthropological setting, right, which this essentially is, and you're getting your data, uh, how are you affecting the data that you're getting? And then what you're doing with it. So. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So Erica, would you say that a person's worldview is really their personal model in, in themselves that that you're trying to find out what the commonality is amongst everyone else because everyone has a worldview of some kind right and that's, that's what they base all their decisions on right so that's exactly what we're doing and what we call community-based system dynamics modeling is what you're trying to do is you have each individual mental model right of you know how people make decisions that are like my mental model is my my i would say Perfect. bias always sounds so negative but more it's my worldview uh, and I make decisions based on that worldview. I decided to come to Cornell because of my worldview, for example. <laughs> uh, and um, so, and then when you're doing this on a community level, right, you're trying to elucidate community-based knowledge that's shared uh, as well as individual. And then what you do is you build a series of exercises uh, and this was all developed by a wonderful um, professor um, at WashU called um, Peter Hoffman. Uh, and he has a book called the Community Based System Dynamics that talks about how to do this. And, um, it, and, and also he's very much reflective towards ethics as well um, as he's doing it. But um, so, yes, they have their individual mental models, but there's also some community level dynamics that are going on and then community mental models, if you will, so. I have more of a comment than a question in the sense that uh, you, you sort of brought me back to the industrial ecology and particularly Kallenberg in uh, Denmark, which I visited oh. as an example, which now is being talked about pretty much in the Netherlands in terms of circularity, as you mentioned. But I, I wanted to also mention that uh, I don't know whether you've heard of CEDA yet, Cornell Institute for Digital Agriculture, but this is a, a group and an institute to which what you showed in terms of robotic milking and things like that, which by the way, are close to my heart being a biological agricultural engineer. Oh. And uh, I think your engagement with CEDA could be a tremendous asset. I, I've only um, been shown their way via the website, and I'm looking forward to developing and cultivating relationships between CETA and, and systems engineering, because I think it would be incredibly valuable. And I also feel like I'm 
at least partly on their team in general in terms of like where I've come from um, with industrial ecology. And um, I also want to say too that um, I live on a farm. Um, I live like right, it's nighttime in Norway right now, but um, yeah. we live uh, on a small um, crofter's place. And uh, that's very much tied into this kind of cultural system and what we call, call it, it's systems of symbolic logic is how we describe it. And a lot of decision-making is not based on economic rationalization and milking robots is one of them. They're based on, on, on very different uh, decision-making processes. And it's so fascinating to bring, um, you know, where I live in my community, my husband's heritage too, coming from this, uh, and then also bringing it together with, socio uh, with rural sociology and um, industrial ecology. It's been a very rewarding uh, experience. So, Yeah, just to quickly say that there is, as you're, I think, suggesting <clears throat> an increasing number of robots, which can only handle 50 cows, basically, uh, in the smaller farms because it's of 60, labor. It's actually, yeah. And also the uh, opportunity to finally have a life. <laughs> That's exactly what we were looking at in this research in subjective well-being. They weren't, I mean, they wouldn't even have 60 cows. They would have like 25 cows and they would still be getting a milking robot and they would never make this money back, even with subsidies. But, and they would never give up their farm because their farm is so tied into their, their identity uh, rural identity, cultural identity. There's a lot of heritage involved in that pro in those dynamics. And so at, they want to have a normal life as if they had a normal job and the milking robots allow them to do that. So they, yeah. they are able to, to really keep hold of this. That's so tied into their, their identity. Um, and then they're able to like actually have a normal job on the side to allow them to have income. So essentially they have two jobs, ones where they're losing money <laughs> and one where they're making what like more normal people money. Right. So yeah, yeah. Uh, they're, they're subsidizing their own job, their other job. Yeah, yeah. So, but thank you for bringing that up. I'm really excited to, to, uh, to, to speak with Sita. So. Great. Uh, I was thinking um, you focus very much on the process. Uh, so you're interested, if I understand correctly, very much on this process of co co you call it co-production. Usually I call it co-creation. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was wondering, do you think that, uh, I mean, for us uh, in academia, uh, when we are in academia, we understand that, that that's our role to create, to create knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that when you collaborate with uh, different uh, stakeholders, uh, they are contributing a lot when sometimes they are not actually so clearly uh, understanding how much they are co-creating. So how important is that, that it makes it clear for them that they are that you are recognizing, because you may be coaching this process, but how important is it that they recognize that they are part of this co-creation process? Yeah, it's it's essential to do that, and the reason is is because you um, it really comes down into the design of your research project in or, in order for that to happen. So one of the one of the things that can happen, which is not very good as part of this process, is that they're seen as showing up to a bunch of workshops and you're giving them data, and then you're done with them, and then you do what you need with what they have to tell you, and they you've kind of taken their creative license, right? and you're doing what you will with it. Uh, and so what happens is, is um, as part of the, the dissemination process, and I mean, I know you're also coming from KTH, so I know you probably had to have been part of a lot of these EU proposals and that they, building up these EU proposals is a huge part on impact and what, it, dissemination and exploitation. And part of that and how we design those processes um, is through, um, different avenues of public engagement that last post project. So for instance, you're creating, and one of the simplest ways that this happens is that you create a, a stakeholder forum that then for instance, they are seeing what you're creating uh, as part of the project. Um, one of the other way, and this is actually just part of the normal process that I use is that you have, um, there's never just like one, 
one workshop or something like that. It's always a series so that when you come back, you're usually, uh, if it's a modeling based one, then you're going back there for model validation for your stakeholders. You're showing them what you took to out of that, that process that the, the co-creation, co-production of knowledge. And then you, um, are like, quantifying it and you're not showing them obviously a set of equations uh you're showing them through pictures and diagrams how the modeling is working and then you can or choose not to depending on how it's going show actual simulations at that point but then there's always another project or another workshop that comes after that then where you're showing them based on the feedback from the second workshop how what they're doing what that eventually led to that's just during the life cycle of the project itself and then the then the forums that are as part of that project but post project and this is the most important part for understanding impact um, is when you're taking then this if it's a tool um, or if it's some sort of what what very often happens especially in EU projects is you get these knowledge platforms which then for instance the stakeholders have access to uh, and they can get resources from that they helped create themselves uh, together with other stakeholders to get some something out of it for them personally, their community, their industry very often. So, for example, in a project that I'm on right now on Coastal Community, this is an EU project. Um, and it's about um, developing industries in rural, um, like coastal communities in Europe. And then, so for instance, if you want to develop some sort of tourist industry, for example, you're just yourself, just a local person, and you want to get into some sort of um, like tourism business and, and start it, then, for instance, you're able to harness the the relationships in the like the social and cultural relationships that exist that are being um, uh, elucidated through the project and then able to then build on that for your own personal gain uh, in developing uh, whatever it is that you're interested in and I think and the management of that post project is a bit tricky uh, and usually at least in where I am in Europe it's housed at particular research institutes but there's no reason why it couldn't be um, either through a non-profit or a university so I think that part is the really key thing to take out and actually make an impact because while you may be creating and changing and having like a transformative learning experience for the stakeholders that are in the room when they're interacting they, that that doesn't necessarily lead to impact unless you're following through in something that is being some sort of structure that is be creating in a project that can be carried out further so yeah and uh, one more question um yeah. have you worked uh, somehow with visualization because you talk a lot of um, about uh, the communication part uh, yes. and creating that communication and visualization is, is very important because otherwise this modeling exercise can also, um, uh, they are, you, you mean to, to make it inclusive, but it can end up being excluding because people feel a bit uh, uh, not understanding the whole process, while visualization usually helps uh, bring in uh, people in a different way. Uh, you did mention that you, you don't show the equations. <laughs> No, no, equations are a really bad idea. <laughs> but uh, but uh, also, the, also on the equations, uh, maybe I had a colleague also worked on this uh, uh, decision-making uh, modeling. And, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, groups, they, they, they kind of narrow down their preferences. And, and if you are working in a community, often it's not one decision. It's not a, the decision on the wind farm, but it's also the wind farm, uh, in conjunction with some other issues that are happening. And then, of course, the modeling can help you put together these different variables that people usually don't put in their uh, own heads. Uh, and, um, and then he's a mathematician, this colleague of mine. And then he, he said that many times he had to compromise on the mathematical uh, to actually get across, uh, to, to bring in together something that was acceptable for the, the, the communities. Have you experienced something like that? 
Yeah. So when you're working with different stakeholder groups, you have to reflect when you start engaging with them what the best form of communication is. So for instance, if I'm working with somebody who it like, it's very clear that if I showed them a model in a simulation and I literally go into the background of it and I show the mathematics of how it's working, they're going to connect the dots and that's fine to engage with them. So what you, what really needs to happen is you need to make an assessment right at the beginning of, you know, what is the best way to communicate with each of these groups? And there's not one right answer for everybody. But I also want to say that they're like, and I didn't do this personally. This is a colleague of mine who was working in sub-Saharan Africa in Zambia, and she was working with illiterate farmers and she was doing this. And so even things that it was with pictures and it was with like, for instance, when she was trying to show money in a system, she put monthly, she had this big white board and she had just some money and then drawing arrows. And when they had water, it was a glass of water. And when there was soil, there was a pile of soil and they were doing all this and drawing this on a whiteboard in the middle of a field on a farm with all of the different farmers and their wives. And it was fantastic. So my point is, by saying that, is that you can find diverse forms of communication, regardless of who your stakeholders are, because their knowledge is incredibly valuable. Uh, and also the, the what you're trying from a systems perspective, what you want to impart to them, the different relationships between these different things. They, that's where the transformative part happens is that when you start sharing this knowledge and you need to find then whatever that route is. And what I would say though, is um, I have to give like a lot of like, like I always say, you don't want to show equations. And obviously that's not true hundred percent of the time, but I also have to say that, you know, we don't want to belittle the experience of, you know, like of the stakeholder, like the, the, we need to give them credit that they understand how certain processes work. We're not going in there as if they're, for instance, they, they don't know anything about their own system. So we definitely don't want to go in like, I, let me teach you something that you already know. And let me bring all this stuff to you. Because again, like you're a stakeholder in this system and I have my value here as the person that's doing it and they have their value. Uh, and when you come in, they, like you said, they might not be very happy, uh, like with what you have to tell them. Uh, and it, it may be because of communication. Um, but it also may be that you're providing information on something that they don't want to believe is true. And I certainly feel that this happens a lot when I'm working with political stakeholders. Um, and it's very, tr it's a very tricky line to, to walk. Um, yeah. Question in the chat box. So to someone who is skeptical about the idea of using quantitative models for these qualitative social systems as concept, how do you convince them? Is there a case study you point as that shows modeling <clears throat> be useful for a social system despite all the uncertainties? The first thing that I say instead of a case study, um, the first thing that I wind up telling them is, um, which is almost 100% true, at least in the initial stages of modeling, is that I'm doing translation work. What I'm doing with these equations is I'm taking things that they already hold as true or as, you know, in their working theories about different social concepts, and I'm just representing them mathematically that I'm just translating them. Uh, I build out things from there to, cause I'm looking at this from a systems perspective. So I'm looking at maybe feedback loops that haven't been, you know, really investigated uh, in different disciplines yet. Um, uh, so when I start at that, that usually helps a lot <laughs> to, because what it does is I'm showing that they have immense value uh, for, and, and uh, it's, like a hundred percent true. I can't do my work without theirs. Uh, their work comes first. Um, they're the ones that are the experts in these social systems. And then I wind up describing that, describing what they already hold as true about these systems uh, as, as part of a simulation model. And then I go from there. And then I say, there are, uh, and then I, I wind up walking through the parts that are most uncertain. But the thing that I wind up saying the most after that is that, um, and this is, there was one person that I just could not win over, just 
no matter what I said, they had something else for me. But what, so I always liked it. His name is Paul. I won't have to give any more information than that. But he, so Paul, he's German. I'll say that. <laughs> Paul from Germany. Uh, he uh, like he he very much had he was he was like how you were describing in this comment. That was Paul. Uh, and Paul was uh, really um, determined that there was no way that what I do was useful and would ever because I could not model the whole system. And because there were uncertainties. Uh, and so I, and I would say all the things, you know, I'm translating and, you know, everybody's making assumptions when they're doing any kind of research, not just modeling and, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then I, and then still nothing, nothing, stonewall, stonewall. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you know, just uh, diplomacy is not a silver bullet. But then I say this, <laughs> policymakers still have to make decisions, even when there are assumptions even when there is uncertainty. Policymakers love policy models. <laughs> Wouldn't you rather work with somebody who is bringing your work into there instead of just having it as the qualitative background? Because when you have policy models and then policy politicians are relying on them, they're like, oh, well, you have to make sure you think about this and this and this. And you know, of course that's not part of the model because this is much more qualitative. Wouldn't you rather have what you're doing being brought in in a very inclusive way so that it's represented in some way, even though it is not 100% perfect. That's kind of where we got to the agree to disagree <laughs> level of the conversation, Paul and I. Um, but I, I think when it comes to policy decision makers, that's the area where they realize that they themselves want to have the most impact. And this gives them another route in which to do so. So. Thank you. That was a great question. Have you developed any system models in a tool to document your behaviors and social structures? I think I'm not quite sure what you mean, Wes. <laughs> Maybe you can unmute and elaborate yeah. a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you know, when you're, you're doing system science, right? I mean, I this is a part of the system science area, the sociology, behavior, and... Um, Modeling helps you document what uh, behaviors you're observing. It's a form. It's not necessarily an equation, but it helps you document. Have you uh, started any kind of documenting like that in a model? Because we are we are system modelers, some of us. <laughs> yeah, and I also wanted yes. to make sure that I, because uh, I know that a lot of people were invited to this talk from diverse disciplines. So um, I, I, I know I talked a lot about modeling, but modeling is also not also, I do other things other than just strictly the modeling. And one of those is more from a system science perspective and developing systems theory. And, 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 and I, I really do have... Um, uh, a, a lot of interest in, in working in a non-modern context with, with, you know, um, systems. So, but when it comes to documenting, um, different, like, I would say system structure that's, you know, has emergent behavior from that. One of the things that I have been working a lot with in the last years is creating perception structures. So perception modeling. Um, and, one thing that I feel like is missing a lot and why I kind of got into this, this is also one of the, this is the reason, or well, not one of the reasons, it is the reason that I am the thread chair for the system dynamics conference on psychology and human behavior is because I do this work. And it's where you, for instance, look at information networks uh, in, and how that interacts with fundamental human values in different communities, and then how that creates opinions about a topic. And that's what we I'm calling perception modeling. Um, and so these are the different structures that are I'm starting. A lot of this is done in non academic. Well, well, it's not done in journals, like I'm not publishing this in journals, because of the work has been done for government. Uh, and the work has been done for industry. And uh, part of um, projects that are not meant for academic consumption. So uh, one of my goals is to have this more documented uh, and have this written in a way, for instance, that other people can re reproduce this work. Right. It's a scientific method, mm -hmm. which means you got to 
document your processes and your all your environmental conditions and mm-hmm. and things like that. So, um, yeah. Well, I'm building I'm building a repository at Cornell, so you're welcome to uh, contribute to the repository for my. Well, I know you were the SysML person, and one of the things I'm working on now is on infrastructure and cybersecurity and building social system structure in SysML as a plugin for that. So. Yeah, let me there know. Are certainly, conversations help. we should have about that. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Enjoy it. Well, I don't know if there's any more questions, but I should feel like I should at least put this on the last slide. So, if there's anybody that wants to further the conversation, it's just to set up a meeting with me, hopefully in your morning, so it won't be too late for me here in Norway. <laughs> when are you coming over? Yeah, so I'm arriving the last week. Um, uh, I'm, I'll be there about the 25th of June. I start on July 1st. So. Okay. And a couple of days for jet lag, right? <laughs> you know, I'm pretty resilient in the jet lag department, <laughs> so I'm not too worried. The kids I'm more worried about. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Erica. And um, this also an invitation for everyone to connect with Erica before or after she joins so that you can actually meet with her. But thank you so much. This was really exciting and interesting. Thank you. It was such a pleasure to be here. And also just thank, I want to thank everybody for their uh, fantastic questions and comments. It was really great to, to be able to share my story with all of you and then uh, hear yours as well. Have a good day. Thank you. Take care, Eric. Erica. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>